One of the first forms of communication was the semaphore. It had one definite drawback, however. It could not be used at night nor during inclement weather. This particular one was used by Napoleon in the early 1800s. In England, Cook and Wheatstone developed a so-called needle telegraph. Here, the operators, called needle clerks, many of whom were women, by the way, read the position of the indicating needle for the message. All of these methods were slow. This changed in 1844 when Samuel Morris demonstrated the telegraph and used the world's first key, which he called a correspondent, which tapped the first code on a wire. Within six months, the lever key appeared and was much easier to handle. From then on, they were in business sending news and messages instantly over the wires. And all of the earlier slow, unwieldy systems were shelved in favor of the alphabet using the simple code of dots and dashes as we use today. Although the dots and dashes were for a short time recorded on a paper tape, they were soon received on a sounder, and the telegraphers wrote out the words as they chattered over the wire. This is one of the earliest keys, an original camelback made in 1849. Perhaps a similar key sent news of the 1849 Sutter's Mill Gold Rush out there in California. Who knows? And here's another camelback. The curved lever, of course, gives it its name. A slightly different version of the telegraph camelback key. Note the design made it easier for the operator. Telegraph keys with lengthy bolt connections going through the operating table or desk were known as leg keys. As early as 1855, sending records were set with these keys by a James Fisher, a professional telegrapher who sent 55 words in one minute. By the way, I understand Fisher was only 18 years old. The operator at the other end, who copied uh, this 55 words a minute, used a pen and ink and was also a professional, and he supposedly, according to the records anyway, was only 15. Here's a contemporary model of the time known as a straight lever key. This is also a lug key. Note the bolts to go down through the table there. Here we have a straight lever and a camelback. These were popular from the 1850s to oh, sometime in the 1890s. These are the keys that became popular from the 1890s on. They were manufactured by J.H. Bunnell Company 
Western Union, and others. Here is a portable or pocket key, which was used by a linesman for repairing a line. You could climb a pole, remove the key from his pocket, and clip on the telegraph line. Note, there is both a key and sounder. The key is at left and the sounder at right. Such a key may have been used in military service. I guess one uh, could call it almost the first transceiver. Here's another odd key, a very collectible, an 1880 Wizard Railroad key. This is a later strap key whose ancestors date back to the 1840s. This type of key was also used in alarm boxes for fire and police calls. This odd looking device was known as a pump handle key and used around 1900. I doubt the operator ever made any uh, speed records. Uh, what do you think? Here's a banal side swiper. Dots and dashes could be made in either direction. I made one uh, one time out of a hacksaw blade. That was a long time ago. The history of early landline telegraphy can best be found in books written by Prescott and others. Great stories have been written about early telegraphers, their deeds in the Civil War or sending the alarm, such as at the time of the Johnstown Flood. Before we talk about semi-automatic keys, let us look at a cable key. Cable keys were always double keys. One key was used to send a minus voltage or dash, and the other a positive voltage or a dot. This was necessary since a dot or dash couldn't be distinguished at the receiving end due to the large capacity and inductance and the lengthy undersea cable. Such a key is in the AWA Museum. The semi-automatic key allowed greater speed and helped the telegrapher who may have developed a telegrapher's paralysis or commonly known as a glass arm. The first semi-automatic was the autoplex which appeared in 1902. But by 1904, the first Viproplex model came on the market, and from then on, the speed keys were the kings on the telegraph wires. Within two years, there was another type called the Mechograph that the telegrapher's nickname the right angle bug. Note the paddle on the right side. This key is very collectible.
These right angle bugs were popular with the railroad telegrapher. This is a smooth operating model which appeared about 1909. Nineteen ten saw the first fully automatic key, the Hewlett, which operated by a spring wound motor. It would send dots and dashes automatically. The keying paddle looks like one of our present day electronic keyers. One of these rare devices is in the AWA Museum. About 1911, the Viproplex company produced one with separate levers. The company was always trying something new, and usually they were always right. By the time the United States entered the First World War, it was found that a different type of semi-automatic key was needed to fit into the crowded operating desk. And again, Viproplex developed a vertical or upright key, better known as the Wire Chief's Key. However, everyone called it a vertical bug. This key, by the way, is also highly collectible and very rare. By the early 1920s, the bugs or semi-automatics began to appear just about everywhere. Typical was the Viproplex number 6, which was later changed to the Lightning Bug. Now here's an odd one. This is a triplex that could be used either by a left hand or a right hand operator. Or the center position, it could be used as a hand key. The small neural release nut at the left would allow the operator to turn the key 90 or 180 degrees for either right or left hand operation. In the center position, of course, it was the conventional hand key. And then there was the gold bug, which a lot of wiremen really liked. And for that matter, so did the radio amateur. It was a very popular key. And then there were the miniature bugs, like the Ultimate, that could be carried in a pocket to sport events. This was one of the many keys used by the telegraphers at the Dempsey-Tunney fight. In the mid-30s, code champion Ted McElroy was advertising his own type of speed key. That was both a favorite with the commercial as well as the amateur operator. And to make sure of his record as well as his invention, he called it the Mac Key. This is one of the smaller and more rarer of the Mac keys. And the 1940s found the Viproplex offering their gold-plated presentation model. That was the dream key of many radio amateurs.
Another key of the period was this odd bug that created both dashes and dots automatically, the Melahan Valiant. It was short-lived. The 1950s introduced a bug that appeared too late for the market because now the electronic keyer was becoming popular. Only a few models of this one called the Colotrill were made. Electronic keyers is another field which we will not go into at this time. Until now, we've discussed keys that were designed and primarily used for landline telegraphy, although most keys manufactured after 1900 could be used for radio. Let us now concentrate on wireless or radio. This awkward-looking device was one of the first keys used by Marconi and known as the Grasshopper Key. Early radio keys were generally large and heavy, the reason for this being the need to have large, heavy contacts, since the key usually broke the primary of a high-voltage transformer. This massive brute keyed 10 kilowatts. Here's a graceful commercial key of 1910 vintage. A ship installation of the period. The noisy spark transmitter is housed in the small room at right. Some keys had contacts that met in a well of oil to protect the flash of the heavy arcing of contact. They also had a shield under the knob to protect the operator's fingers. Commercial keys took on a variety of sizes and shapes. The key at upper right, with a switch on the side, is a Marconi key, typical of the Titanic period. And this is a smaller Marconi wireless key. An interesting radio key is the flame-proof type used aboard aircraft and submarines where sparking contacts could cause an explosion. Here is an early military flame-proof key made by General Radio. The contacts, of course, are enclosed uh, to prevent uh, air or anything getting near the actual arc or sparking of the key. And still another one seen at right. And how about keys used by early radio amateurs? This is a 1920 Rico key used to primary key a high power spark transmitter. The Cadillac of amateur keys was the Boston key made by the Clap Esam Company. The components were mounted on a marble base and sold for the high price of $15 in 1915. Only the affluent ham could afford one. Well, 
One of the old standbys for the radio amateur was this rugged key made by Bunnell. It has been in use by radio amateurs for nearly 75 years. Now for some uh, related objects. This is a banal telegraph practice set. The key would mechanically operate the sounder at right. I trust you're all well aware that there are two codes. The original Morse, which one copied by clicks around a sounder. and the continental used in radio transmission. This chart shows the difference. Note, for an example, the letters C and F. All told, there were 11 characters plus numbers and punctuations difference between the continental and the original Morris. This is a manual code learning machine. Most machines of this type, however, were spring wound, such as the uh, Omnograph. This is a box relay used in early landline telegraphy. The key was mounted on the same board as the box relay sounder. Such objects date back in the 1800s and are highly collectible. Here's an odd uh, practice set. In addition to the key at right, one could manually run the pencil-like object at left through the grooves, completing the circuit for dots and dashes. Some keys have historical significance. This key, now in the W3WRE collection, was used by Ray Myers, W6MLZ, which he used to send the SOS from the polar submarine Nautilus, summoning help for the stranded Wilkins expedition in 1931. Truly an historical key. This wireless key was used in early Fessenden equipment. Fessenden was a famous pioneer who made the first musical broadcasts on Christmas Eve in 1906. A close-up of the nameplate. And this may well be one of the largest keys. A commercial key made by Massey Wireless, which supposedly keyed a high-power Alaskan spark station. Massey outfitted early steamers operating between Massachusetts and New York. Another little collectible item. A replica tie class worn by old-time RCA operators. And now for the smallest, an exact J.H. Bunnell replica, and one can see the size by comparing it with a penny. The key and sounder are part of a key set given to Western Union executives and is highly prized by key collectors.
Does it work? You bet it does. Mounted under the marble base are two AA batteries. Press the key and the little sounder will click. Both the W3WRE collection and the AWA Museum have several historical one-of-a-kind keys. This is the charred remains of the Viproplex that sent the SOS from the burning ship, the Morrill Castle, in 1934. Authenticity of the key is verified by the radio operator who sent the SOS. Ironically, in later years, it was determined that this radio operator who sent the SOS was really the firebug who started the fire. Commercial spark stations were phased out shortly after World War I. Old-time amateur stations are also of the past, except this one, such as 2AN at the AWA Museum. And surprising, there are still many radio amateurs who still prefer the straight hand key over a semi-automatic or a electronic keyer. Fortunately, there is an interest in early landline equipment with several fine collections, including a quantiplex system at the Ford Museum. The crude instrument in the foreground is an 1840 replica of a code receiving machine, recording dots and dashes on a paper tape. An early collector was Stu Davis, W2ZH, who had an excellent collection of both landline and commercial radio keys. If you're a key collector, we highly recommend Bill Holly's book on the history of the Viproblex. Bill did a terrific job, K1BH, in recording and documenting the history of this famous semi-automatic. The AWA Museum has three areas devoted to keys and landline equipment. This is the end of our story. The use of landline Morris disappeared years ago, and the use of commercial CW is just a matter of time. But as radio amateurs, let us keep the use of code a viable means of communication. So long, everyone. Or should I say 73s? For those of you who uh, wish to listen, I'm going to play back part of a tape recorded at the Smithsonian Institution at an AWA conference in 1968. This is a high-speed Morris demonstration between Stu Davis and Ralph Graham. These fellows demonstrated on the stage in front of a large audience how to handle traffic in Morris, landline Morris, by transmitting for nearly one hour 110 messages, 110 messages per hour this includes the preamble, the text, and the signature. The complete message, 110 messages in one hour. So what you're about to listen to is to believe the world's last high-speed code Morse demonstration. So if you think you can copy Morse, hey, lots of luck. Here she goes.